High school has taught us that light refracts, or bends, when it moves into a substance with a different index of refraction, obeying a principle known as Snell's Law. But what if we instead consider a material where the index of refraction is continuously changing? The light is now refracted an infinite number of times as it travels, rendering the equation here essentially useless. A real-world example of this situation is air. Hotter air has a lower index of refraction than cold air, so in the region above a very hot body of water or sand, continuous temperature gradients will cause light to travel in curved paths, creating optical illusions. However, before we start tackling continuously changing indices of refraction, let's take a bit of a detour and talk about fiber optic cables, the wires that are used to send digital information over long distances. In its most basic form, fiber optic cables consist of an outer cladding that acts sort of as the fiber skin and an inner core where the light actually travels. Let's zoom in on a 2D cross section of this cable. Whenever the ray of light hits the outer cladding, it undergoes total internal reflection. However, sometimes, instead of reflecting, the light will refract out of the cable entirely, causing some valuable data to be lost. This problem can be worsened if the wire is bent too much, a phenomenon known as macro bending. This then prompts the natural question, can you make a fiber optic cable that doesn't rely on total internal reflection to operate? Well, to answer that question, let's take a look at this thought experiment. Imagine instead you had a fiber optic cable whose core didn't have a constant index of refraction. Instead, the value of n at any given point changes continuously. Specifically, it changes depending on how far that point is from the core's central axis, with the value increasing as you get closer to the core. Visually, we can represent this continuous spectrum using a color gradient, with greener areas representing a higher value of n. This type of cable is specifically called a gradient index fiber optic cable, or just a GRIN fiber for short. Although our ultimate goal is to analyze the practical uses of this unconventional design, it's difficult to figure out how to really put numbers to this problem. So let's just start with forming a qualitative understanding of how a ray of light will travel while inside the core. And to do that, we'll take a look back at our old friend, Snell's Law. When light travels into a medium with a higher index of refraction, like from air into water, the angle of incidence will be greater than the angle of refraction. Qualitatively, it appears like the light is being bent towards the normal. When we flip the scenario, the angle of incidence is now less, meaning the light is bent away from the normal instead. Let's see how we can apply those facts to our grain fiber optic cable. There's just one small problem. With a continuously changing index of refraction, there's just so many potential paths to consider. Maybe an incident beam of light will asymptotically approach the edge of our core. Maybe the path is some sort of clean periodic function. Or perhaps the light will just oscillate rapidly in a seemingly random shape. To solve this unfamiliar problem, let's first turn it into something we've seen before. To do that, Divide the cylindrical core into three regions with three different indices of refraction. To make this new cable more similar to our original Grin cable, we'll establish that the indices of refraction decrease as they get farther from the central axis. We can simulate what light entering this cable would look like using basic applications of Snell's Law. First, when light reaches the air cable boundary, it will bend toward the normal line which in this case is also our central axis. Then, at the boundary between the first and second layer of the core, it will bend away from the normal, though keep in mind that the normal is now a vertical line. Once the light reaches the end of the second layer, let's assume it undergoes total internal reflection, since the light has to reflect somewhere, otherwise it'll escape the cable entirely. We can now repeat this process, tracing out a rough sketch of the path the ray of light traces until it reaches the other end of the cable. The zigzag pattern we end up with is pretty reminiscent of what we saw earlier in a traditional fiber optic cable, and thus is probably a pretty bad representation of our grin cable.
To improve the approximation, let's increase the number of layers in our core. And if we keep doing this, we can see that our approximation doesn't look so rough anymore. Just this scene alone can help provide some intuition for why green fiber optic cables can be so incredibly useful in practice. The light here never actually makes contact with the outer cladding, so problems like macro bending are completely gone. Now let's return to the problem at hand. Sure, we now know that the light will travel in what looks like a sine function, but nothing we've done so far will help us model the light's path quantitatively, right? Well, let's see. Back now with our green fiber, if we're going to start working with numbers, we're going to have to quantify precisely how the index of refraction changes. So far, we've been using the vague statement that n decreases as you get farther from the central axis. To put those words into numbers, we'll need to define a function n that takes y, aka the distance from the central axis, as an input and outputs a value of n. So what should n of y be? First off, n should clearly be a decreasing function, and secondly, by definition, we should have n of 0 equal n0. Next, based on the definition of the index of refraction, n of y should always be strictly greater than 1 for any value of y. And finally, the function should incorporate the value of r into it somehow. In practice, a commonly used function is the square root equation up here, and I encourage you to take a moment to convince yourself that this function satisfies all the conditions below. Let's return to our simplified version of the cable, with only four layers. After tracing out the light's path and drawing in the normal lines, we can zoom in on just the first hump in the light's trajectory. If we apply Snell's law to the three points where the beam of light changes mediums, we get these three equations here. However, one clever observation we can make is that theta 3 and 4, along with theta 5 and 6, are alternate interior angle pairs and thus equal to each other. This means that our many different versions of n sine theta are all equal to some constant k. Another way of saying this is that n sine theta is a conserved quantity that never changes. Even if you increase the number of layers, n sine theta at any of the normal lines will always be equal to some constant. And of course, this will be true as the number of layers approaches infinity, becoming a true Grin fiber. Specifically, the index of refraction at any point times the sine of the angle between the tangent and normal lines will always be equal to some quantity k. Let's solve for theta in this equation. Now why is that helpful? If the angle between a line and the y-axis is theta, we can draw a dashed line perpendicular to the y-axis and label the legs of this right triangle delta x and delta y. By definition, the cotangent of theta will be the ratio of delta y to delta x, which also happens to be the line slope. So to recap, we know that at any point along the curve, the angle between the tangent line and the normal line is the inverse sine of k over n of y, and the slope of that tangent line is the cotangent of theta. We can plug the first equation into the second, giving us the slope of the tangent line, aka dy dx, as a function of y. Our hope is that using this equation, we can do some reverse engineering to find an explicit equation for the shape of this curve. The only problem is that the equation on the right looks super messy and hard to work with, so let's clean it up first. Conveniently, we have a trig function and an inverse trig function, so let's see if we can get those to cancel out somehow. To find a right triangle with unique angle theta such that the opposite leg is of length k, and the hypotenuse has the length n of y. For completeness, let's also apply the Pythagorean theorem to solve for the adjacent leg. Now, by definition, this inverse sine term is simply the value of theta in this triangle, and the cotangent of that same angle is just the ratio of the adjacent leg to the opposite leg. Plugging that in and multiplying the 1 over k into the square root, we now have gotten rid of the two trig expressions, but this new expression might be even more complicated. However, let's try to get rid of the variable k entirely by using a trick. 
If we consider the point where light enters the core and define phi as the complement of theta, we have k equals n0 sine 90 degrees minus phi, or just cosine of phi. If we take this expression for k and plug it in, it gets rid of the variables k and n0 at the expense of introducing a new variable phi. Finally, let's clean up things a tiny bit more by turning secant of phi squared minus 1 into just tan of phi squared. We have three variables now, phi, r, and y. However, it's key to remember that phi and r are both constants, so y is the only variable here we actually need to worry about. With that in mind, solving this differential equation isn't too bad. I encourage you to give it a try yourself, but the main key is recognizing the derivative of arcsine in the integrand on the right. Evaluating both integrals yields this equation here. To solve for y, let's divide, take the sine of both sides, and multiply to get our final function. And bam, here's our function graphed out. You can see how lowering phi compresses the light's path, as expected. Also, since r is located at two different parts of our function, changing r thus changes the curve's amplitude and period, which graphically results in both vertical and horizontal compressing as r is decreased. Amazing, we've done a lot so far, so let's do a quick recap to see if there are any gaps left in our knowledge. Although we first try to imagine how the light could travel down the cable using rectangular approximations for the gradient, by applying the premise that Snell's law can be extended into a general conservation law, we arrived at a differential equation, allowing us to solve for an explicit function. However, there's just one small nagging doubt left to address. What's the catch here? Or more precisely, does this statement always hold true? After all, Conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, those laws get violated all the time. So what are we missing? Well, to be honest, so far we've only really talked about green fibers. So let's take a look at another visually appealing case study, where the index of refraction decreases in all directions starting from a central point. In this material, suppose I gave you two points, A and B, and asked you to find the path light would take to travel between those points. Clearly, there are an infinite number of paths, but only one correct one, and as our luck would have it, for that one correct path, n sine theta is not conserved. But why? Why does our wonderful conservation law fail? And without it, what are we gonna do? To figure out why it fails, let's do what we always do, and take an approximation of this gradient. This time, by using concentric circles with decreasing indices of refraction. Let's zoom in and draw the path a random ray of light might take in this medium. If we draw in the normal lines and relevant angles for the two points at which the light refracts, it becomes clear why n sine theta is no longer conserved. In our green fiber, since all the normal lines were parallel, we took advantage of the congruency of alternate interior angles, a property that we can no longer use here. In fact, it can be proved through some calculus that n sine theta is conserved if and only if all the normal lines are parallel to one another. So now what? Well, to find out how light travels from A to B, we will have to introduce a new concept, Fermat's principle of least time, which states that when traveling between any two points, light always takes a path which is quickest. This fact alone can act as a foundation to derive both the law of reflection and Snell's law. Now let's use some math language. Define P of AB as a set of possible paths from A to B, and use gamma to represent a specific path in that set. Additionally, by definition, the speed of light at any point in space is C divided by the index of refraction at that point. Finally, the time it takes light to traverse that path is given by this integral here. By plugging the first equation into the second, our goal is to minimize the value of T. In other words, determine the path gamma such that the value of this integral is minimized. We now have a concrete optimization problem to work on, though unfortunately, further progress will require much more advanced calculus. Although we've hit a bit of a mathematical wall here, I'd like to leave you with an extremely brief overview of one last example that I find to be particularly intriguing. Consider a substance where the index of refraction equals the inverse of the distance from the origin squared. 
Incidentally, that implies that n equals infinity at the origin, an impossibility that we'll ignore for now. In this scenario, if you choose any random point for a photon to start at, and any direction for it to travel in, it'll eventually turn around and head towards a singularity of infinite density at the center, forever being sucked into the black hole, yet never able to actually reach it.